Hello everyone, this is Professor Sansom and we're going to do the pre-lab for experiment 11, which is about electrochemistry. So uh, first I want to talk about our learning objectives. We're going to be doing a redox chemistry, so we want to make sure you know how to define oxidation and reduction and diagram an electrochemical cell including the electrode, solution, salt bridge, and flow of electrons. So knowing all those pieces that are necessary and how they work together. Um, we also want to make sure that you can identify which uh, electrode is going to be the anode and which will be the cathode and use that to calculate the cell potential. And relate the cell potential to delta G, uh, which is of course the free energy of the reaction. And our process skill for today would be management, but since you're not doing it in lab, uh, we're not going to have a process skills quiz. So we're going to be talking about redox reactions, and uh, redox reactions are of course oxidation and reduction happening at the same time, and there's lots of different ways to define them. Initially, oxidation was gaining oxygen, that's why it's called oxidation and reduction was the opposite, losing oxygen. But now it's more useful to define them in terms of electrons. Losing electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction, and you can remember this as Leo. Can I make a little E? Leo. The lion goes grr. Ooh, oh my gosh. We're gonna get through this together, you guys. <laughs> okay, so Leo goes there, lose electrons, oxidation, gain electrons, reduction. Um, I tell you that because uh, whenever I do anything with electrochemistry, I always have to stop and figure this out. You know, you've got a 50-50 chance of whether you're oxidizing or reducing, or whether it's the anode or the cathode, if you're gaining electrons or losing electrons. And so I always stop and just walk through each step of that thinking to make sure that I'm doing it right. Um, and I recommend the same to you. Um, the reason that why we care about losing or gaining electrons is because it actually changes the properties of substances if they have different numbers of electrons. I mean, a classic example would be sodium. Sodium zero, that is with all of the normal electrons it's supposed to have, the element sodium is a solid metal, but sodium one plus, meaning it's lost one electron, is an ion that dissolves in solution. Uh, and is found in salt, sodium chloride. Uh, and so very different um, properties based on the number of electrons that they have. Okay, so in oxidation and reduction, what's happening is that electrons are getting transferred. This is spontaneous and exothermic. So as an example here, we have some zinc metal and we've put it into this copper uh, solution where there are copper two plus ions in the solution. And if we just let it sit there, we actually are going to form some copper metal. It's this kind of red-brown spongy stuff. It's spongy copper, so it doesn't look exactly like you're used to seeing copper, but that is elemental copper there. And if we zoom in at the atomic level, what's happening is electrons from the zinc metal are getting attracted to the copper 2 plus ions. They're joining the copper two plus ion, making it a copper atom. And the zinc that has now lost its electron is moving into the solution as a zinc ion. It's lost two electrons, I should say, um, is moving into the, electro into the solution as a zinc ion. So there's this exchange of electrons in the redox reaction. And it turns out it's very exothermic. It produces a lot of heat. If you do this in a beaker, the beaker will get very hot. And that's nice, but heat isn't very useful um, in terms of an energy source, whereas electricity is very useful. We can use it to power things. And so um, we want to learn how do we set this up so that the spontaneous reaction that's happening, so that we can harness those electrons, because we know the electrons are going to be transferred. How can we do it so that we can use them for something? So as a reminder, when we have electrochemistry, something's always oxidized and something's always reduced. Why does that happen? Go ahead and take a second and think about that. You can pause the video.
And one of the reasons why this happens is because of the conservation. We'll see if I can write this, you guys. Conservation of matter, specifically electrons. If something is losing electrons, something else has to gain the electrons. So that's why oxidation always goes together with reduction. And so one way that can be useful to think about this is dividing the overall reaction into two half reactions. So the reaction that we just learned about, we had copper ions in solution and we had zinc metal, and we created copper solid and zinc ions. So which of these is getting oxidized and which is getting reduced? If we remember, oxidation is losing electrons, like Leo. Who here is losing electrons? The zinc metal starts at zero and goes to two plus, so it's zinc that's losing electrons. So we can write our half reaction, which is just for oxidation. It's our zinc solid, and it's making zinc, oopsie, zinc, two plus ions, those are aqueous, in solution, and then it's releasing two electrons. Okay, and our reduction reaction, this is gonna be gaining electrons. If we look at our reaction again, we've got copper two plus ions on the left, copper solid on the right, so our copper two plus is gaining electrons. So we have Cu two plus, which is aqueous, and it's gaining electrons. And we're gonna make Cu solid. Okay, so those are our two half reactions. One of them for oxidation, one of them for reduction. Notice in the half reactions, we're writing out the electrons, but they cancel out. Two electrons are getting gained here, two electrons are getting lost here. And it's always the case if you have a redox reaction that however many electrons are lost should be gained by something else. And so that will always happen that they cancel out. So in this experiment, you guys are gonna be, well, you're not gonna be setting them up. You're gonna watch someone else set up uh, voltaic cells. Um, and a voltaic cell is where you separate the half reactions so that they're actually happening in two separate beakers. Notice over here on the left, we've got zinc becoming zinc ions. Over here on the right, we've got copper ions becoming copper metal. So here, electrons are being lost and the zinc ion goes into solution, but the electrons don't get attached to the copper ion in solution here. There are no copper ions. So instead, the electrons travel through, up through the anode here, through the voltmeter, which can measure the um, essentially amount of electrons that are going through, into the copper metal cathode, where they will uh, stick to one of the copper ions in solution and make copper metal. So over time, the mass of this anode is actually gonna go down, the mass of the cathode is gonna go up, and meanwhile, we've got this nice flow of electrons, so if instead of a voltmeter we put a light bulb here, or a motor, or anything else that needs electricity, we can run that based on this electrochemical reaction that's happening spontaneously. Um, how do we remember which one's the anode and the cathode? I remember it because um, a little expression, two animals went walking, it was an ox, ox, and, oh my gosh, you guys, and a red, red cat. Okay, um, this is my little expression, anode, oxidation, reduction, cathode. Um, you can remember this because it might make sense to have a red ox, but it doesn't make sense to have an cat. So that's how you remember, an ox and a red cat go walking. Um, and again, I tell you these just because it makes it easier to remember. You've got a 50-50 shot. You don't want to get it backwards. Um, notice that the cell that we've constructed has several parts that are necessary for it to happen. We have the solution of zinc ions here along with the zinc um, electrode here, the anode. We have a solution of copper ions here along with a copper anode. 
we have a salt bridge. The salt bridge just allows um, salt ions to move between the two solutions. And this makes it so that electrons can flow, which is the last piece. These have to be connected by a wire at the top. Um, if the electrons are all flowing from the left to the right, we also need positive ions to flow from the left to the right and negative ions to flow the other way to make sure that we maintain charge balance. Okay, so um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is electromotive force, um, or EMF. This is a potential energy difference between the anode and the cathode, and it's also called the cell potential. And so there's this little symbol that we use. Your book makes a really nice one, like a curly Q E, E naught for the cell. This is the cell potential, or standard cell potential when it has this naught here. Um, if we have a positive cell potential, it's spontaneous. If we have a negative cell potential, it's not spontaneous. In other words, the reverse would be spontaneous. And now I've started talking about spontaneity and that should remind you, the cell potential is related to free energy. So how can we calculate the cell potential? Um, we have these tables of standard reduction potentials for a reduction half reaction. So this shows what happens if this guy is going to gain electrons. So copper two plus ions gaining two electrons becoming copper solid. And these are the cell potentials for the metals that you'll use in this experiment. Um, copper has the most positive reduction potential. Magnesium has the most negative reduction potential. And that tells you about their propensity for being reduced or being oxidized. The higher up they are here, the more positive the E naught is uh, for this reduction half reaction that tells you that it's more likely for that to happen spontaneously. Because remember that positive cell potential means that it's gonna be spontaneous in that direction. Whereas a negative cell potential tells you that's not spontaneous. So magnesium is very hard to reduce, um, but very easy to oxidize. Um, the way that we calculate the cell potential for the cell, this is of course a mixture of the anode and the cathode. We take the standard reduction potential for the cathode, just from the table, and we subtract the standard reduction potential for the anode. Um, another way to think about this, whichever one is gonna be the cathode is the one that is the most positive. So if it's higher up in this table, arranged from positive to negative, the higher up one will be more spontaneous, that one will be the cathode where reduction is going to happen. And then we subtract the anode. Um, and if this is positive, then we end up with a spontaneous cell. So in our example, we have zinc and copper. Um, you can see copper here is the one that's getting reduced. It looks the same as it does over here in the standard reduction potentials. So that one's happening at the cathode. So when we solve this, we're gonna find our E naught. E's are hard. We're gonna find our E naught, and it's gonna be 0.34. for our cathode minus negative 0.76 for the anode. Cathode minus anode, and when we're done, when we're done, we should get positive 1.10 volts for our cell potential. So that's the cell potential, the standard cell potential for a copper and zinc cell. So the last thing is to talk about free energy. Remember, our positive cell potential was related to a spontaneous reaction, and that should remind us about delta G. It turns out there's an equation that relates these two. Delta G for the reaction equals negative N F E. Okay, so we have this equation. Notice the negative sign here means that if we have a positive, E naught for our cell, then we'll have a negative delta G, which means it's spontaneous. Um, N here is the number of moles of electrons transferred. This is in a balanced reaction, but also it's hidden because you remember those electrons cancel out. So you kind of have to look at the half reactions to find the number of electrons, moles of electrons that get, that get transferred. In, in our experiment today, everything is either gaining or losing two electrons, so that makes it easy for us.
but you have to pay attention to that for other different kinds of reactions you might see. And then we have the Faraday's constant. This is 96,485 joules per volt mole. Um, in other words, one mole of electrons crossing a potential of one volt will release 96.5 kilojoules of energy. So we can calculate the delta G for our reaction that we just found the E naught of the cell, where delta G equals negative two times 96.485 joules per volt mole. And our cell potential was 1.10 volts. So when I do this, I get a delta G for this reaction of negative 19,297 joules. Okay. These things are related. As a reminder, if we have a positive E naught, it means we have a negative delta G and that is a spontaneous reaction. In the second part of the lab, you're gonna be asked to predict um, which combination of things is gonna be spontaneous. So you have to remember uh, to take into account which thing should be the metal and which thing should be the ions. In other words, the thing that's spontaneously getting reduced is gonna be the ion in the solution because it has to gain the electrons to become a solid. And the thing that's getting spontaneously oxidized should be the metal because it's going to become an ion in the solution or lose electrons. Okay, uh, that's everything for today. Uh, thanks for listening. Good luck with your experiment.